book of John, chapter 6, verse 47 to 71. Shall we please stand? As I call on the men of God. that you have made in our life. Today, Father, we are also remembering the 40 days that you suffered on our behalf in the wilderness. Today we are observing the second week of Lent in which you surrendered yourself as a sacrificial lamb for us. We come before you, O Lord, Meditate upon the sacrifice that you have made in our life. Open our hearts this morning, Father. Consecrate your message, Father. Anoint the tongue that will deliver it. Touch our hearts, O oh Lord. To mean every word of the song that we are singing to you. At the end of this message, Father. Give us the grace to know you more than ever. That our lives may not be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. If we remember, after the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ by John the Baptist, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, without food, without water, without shelter, in the cold, fasting to prepare himself for the sacrifice that he surrendered himself so that you and I could have eternal life. His most conventional churches. They prepare their mind for that Easter, for that sacrifice, through fasting. Suffering also, trying to experience what our Lord Jesus Christ experienced in the wilderness. But we thank God today that even though we worship our God in spirit and in truth, we am sure we are still experiencing, we are still observing what He went through in our mind at home. We will try this morning take us through that journey. And I'm so happy this morning I've been inspired by the song of the choir. Amen. Give my love to you. And I hope, I pray, that we we'll mean it. Because Jesus said, what did he mean when he said, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. The Bible passage will be found in the book of John, chapter 6, verses 47 to 71. The book of John, chapter 6, verses 47 to 71. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, 
which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eat my flesh and drink my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew that from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore, said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Yes. Amen. Amen. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, Amen. the Son of the living God. Amen. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. For he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. May God bless his holy name. What did Jesus mean when he said, take up your cross and follow me? In Matthew 16, 24, Mark 8, 34, and Luke 9, 23, the Bible reads, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that our Lord laid emphasis on the carrying of the cross. And this makes believers wondering, what is the cross and its significance? The cross to most people of the ancient times during the lifetime of Jesus meant only one thing. And that is death. By the most painful and humiliating means human beings could possibly endure. Over the centuries, the true meaning of the cross has gradually changed today. Many people interpret the cross as being some form of burden that man could be saddled with. You could even hear some people making such remarks as, I cannot help it. It is my cross. When maybe their children whom they expected will be there for them, abandon them. Or their husbands ran away with another woman. Or a misfortune happened in the family. They conveniently attribute all human sufferings to their cross. Which they have to bear, even though they are mostly responsible for their misfortunes. 
In other words, cross to them means a thankless job, an unwilling responsibility, or an in inevitable consequences of our wrong choices. But is this the type of cross that Jesus meant? When he said in Luke 9, 23, and he said unto them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I am sure that when Jesus carried his cross up Golgotha to be crucified, no one was thinking of the cross as symbol of a burden as explained above to carry in the days of Jesus. The cross represented nothing else than the most torturous death which the Romans invented as a form of disgrace and dehumanizing punishment. They forced their convicts to carry their own cross, the device of their execution while facing ridicule along the way to death. In the Roman Catholic Church, on that Good Friday, they will appoint a man to carry a makeshift cross. And then you will see people jeering at him. They'll be marching along the street for people to build up, to have an imagination of what Jesus Christ went through. When he was made to carry that cross from the palace of Pontius Pilate to God's quarter, on many occasions he fell down. They beat him, pulled him up to carry the cross. And you could imagine what his mother was going through, watching his own son bleeding with a crown of thorn on his head, with wounds striped all over his body, the flesh torn with horse wheat. For a sin he has not committed. If Christians today could sit down just for five minutes and visualize this, we would do nothing else but to serve God. The God we can do it. But the Father allowed his own son to go through it. Because we read in John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes. This was the picture that the Lord saw and of which he too realized he was going to go through. In order for you and I to be saved from the slavery of sin, when he said, if anyone will follow him, he must be prepared to carry his own cross and follow him today. That picture has changed in the minds and beliefs of many Christians. Many Christians view the cross as a welcome symbol of atonement, of forgiveness, of grace and love. If people really know the real meaning and implications of the cross, I doubt if any jeweler who get any clients coming to buy their stock, but today you see people adorning adorn themselves with necklaces, with cross pendant dangling from their necks and earrings with different shapes of cross dangling from their ears, while the majority of Christians' homes are decorated with a crucifix as a symbol of protection and security. Today, we are asking ourselves once again what Jesus meant when he said, Take up your cross and follow me. I am sure Jesus meant being willing to die in order to follow Jesus. And this is called dying to self. Dying to oneself. And dying to oneself is a call to absolute surrender. After our Lord has expressed his desire, he went on to say in verse 24, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. This simply means that although the call will be tough, but the reward is measurable. You read in the Bible that wherever Jesus went, 
a large crowd followed him. And most of them followed him, believing he was the Messiah. This raises this pertinent question. If following Jesus means ready to give up everything, even to the point of death, did they understand Jesus' call of invitation and the meaning of the cross? To the majority of his followers, and including his 12 disciples, they innocently believe that since he is the Messiah, the Messiah is eventually coming to overthrow the Roman taskmasters over them, who they saw as oppressors. The lives of the children of Israel, if you remember, had been clouded with series of crises, wars, enemy occupations, and slavery, starting from deliverance from Egypt to the time they enter slavery again by the kings of Babylon and in the days of Jesus, being ruthlessly governed by the Roman Empire, that all they could wish for was freedom from oppression as promised by the God of Abraham. To them, Messiah means a king, a liberator, like Prophet Moses, like King David, but his kingdom is greater than their imagination and perceptions. Amen. His kingdom is divine and not of this world, but they could not understand. Even Jesus' own inner circle of disciples thought that the kingdom would be coming soon, as we also read in Luke 1911. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to happen immediately. The twelve disciples conceived in their hearts that since Israel is made up of twelve tribes, when Jesus became the Messiah and occupied his throne, he would make them overseers or leaders over each tribe of Israel. Hence, it resulted in their lobbying for leadership positions. Jesus realized their misconception and hence to prepare their minds for the great sacrifice he has surrendered himself to undertake on the behalf of humanity. Why did Jesus have to surrender himself for this sacrifice? As today is the second Sunday of Lent, we should now be meditating daily before Easter. Why did God allow his son to be crucified for the sin he never committed. And this leads us into asking these questions, which I have often asked myself too. What does the law require for our sins to be forgiven? What does the law require for our sins to be forgiven? Let us see Hebrews 9. 22 to 26. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these. For the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands. A mere copy of the true one but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he will have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the consummation of the ages, he had been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What do we mean by this? In the ancient times, the law of Moses stipulated that every year you bring ram, sheep, goat, whatever is prepared for you to come and atone for your sin. They will slaughter, the high priest will slaughter the, 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 the animal and sprinkle the blood on the altar and make offerings to God for atonement of your sin. Yes. But the priests are sprinkling the blood of 
others not of their own. But in order that God may atone humanity of the sins committed by our father Abraham, it was also necessary that the blood of a man must be shed and not just ordinary man because there was no man. All humanity have sinned from day one of Abraham. So the only man remaining to be offered to sacrifice was Jesus. And Jesus was not a man. He was a spirit, the son of God. Amen. So Jesus had to come in the form of a man. He took up human being 100% Feeling the pain that you suffer, me suffer. Feeling the hunger that you feel, I feel. Feeling the distress that you go through and he went through. And that was why he was able to have listening here to you in your bedroom where you have nothing at all except him. Because he went through it. He was not born in a palace. Neither was he brought up like Moses in the palace of Pharaoh. He was born in a danger. His father was a carpenter. Sometimes they would have food to eat, sometimes no food to eat. So he understood all the sufferings of humanity. Amen. 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 Now, and this one leads us to the second question. What did the death of Christ accomplish? Was it a waste? Did he die for nothing? Apostle Paul offers us an explanation in Romans 3, 25 to 26. Through his faithfulness, God displayed Jesus as the place of sacrifice where mercy is found by means of his blood. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness in passing over sins that happened before, during the time of God's patient tolerance. He also did this to demonstrate that he is righteous in the present time and to treat the one who has faith in Jesus as righteous. Legally, sins cannot be forgiven without the shedding of blood. As we read in Hebrew 9.22, therefore, God forgave the sins of the Old Testament believers out of kindness or forbearance. But since Jesus met the just demands of the law on the cross, God is just in forgiving all who believe in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And this is what Christ meant at the Lord's Supper when he said, This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission that is forgiveness of sins as we also read in Matthew 26, 28. Number three, how did Christian demonstrate God's selfless love for us? How did Christ how did Christ demonstrate God's selfless love for us? We read in 1 John 3, 16 to 17. Hereby, perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But who also had this world's goods and seeth his brother have need and shut up his powers of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him Jesus laid down his life for us so that we might live in his place. And that is why he said in John 12, 31 to 33, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. This is how the cross demonstrated God's selfless love for us sinners. By this supreme sacrifice, Jesus was telling us sinners that he loves us more than himself. 
As you contemplate this supreme sacrifice of Christ, during this divine season of repentance, may you not only be drawn to God, but willingly accept His indescribable gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is when we truly understand the significance and the magnitude of this great supreme sacrifice that we can really appreciate what we owe our God and our duties to Christ Jesus. The following statement, which we should also contemplate upon during this season, summarizes it all. Unquote. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his disposable because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with contestation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. All our sins was upon him in the garden of Gethsemane. And God does not dwell, God does not even touch, God, God does not even move near sin. His whole body was full of sin. So the father had to separate himself from him. He was alone. He was afraid. Will he ever regain back his body? Will he ever regain back his soul? Will he die forever? He was afraid because the father decided him. Because darkness and light don't meet. God is light. And at that hour, our Jesus Christ was covered with darkness. That even his physical pain, he could not even feel it anymore. Because of the anguish of pain in his heart. That was the picture given to us in the Garden of Testament. That they said he was sweating blood. Which was the, 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 the maximum of pain. Maximum of pain that no human being can survive. He went through it. And Satan was his fierce temptation. He wronged the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portraits of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror. Or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was eternal, was permanent. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. Christ fed the anguish which the sinner will feel 